All right, we're going to move on to theme three now. Um, the third theme we're talking about today is Kurong fish. Um, so I'd like to welcome Chi Feng Yi to talk about black brim, green black, green back flounder, and smallmouth hardy head. Sounds good. Thank you, Carol. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to come here to talk about fish flows and ecology in the Kurong. So I probably should say that my talk is generally focused on uh, fish assemblages with representative species. So first I would like to thank my colleague uh, listed here who have made contribution for the last many years. They are my research team. So thank you. So estuaries represent a dynamic interface between freshwater and marine. They need freshwater basically to maintain the system health. And they are quite important fish habitat. So many species, they use the estuaries as nursery ground or feeding ground and also as a refugia area. So it's quite critical. In a word, there are many fisheries that is dependent on estuaries. But also, as you know, that uh, they are unique ecosystem. So many estuaries are Ramsar site, including the iconic Kurong. So there are heaps of uh, fish species. It's quite a diverse range in the Kurong. There are 94 species based on recent uh, BICES publication. They either are of important commercial and recreational fisheries value or they support very important environmental conservation and culture value. So based on their life history, you can divide those fish to different functional groups based on their use of estuary and dependent on estuary. So examples, typical groups include marine estuarine opportunistic. So Mulloway is a typical example that they spawn in the marine system, but the juveniles moving to the Kurong and using that as nursery ground, and they grow out and they move back to the marine system. So greenback flounder is also having a similar life history, spawn in the marine and use Kurong as nursery ground. And you also got a group of estuarine species, so-called solely estuarine, they can complete their entire life cycle within the estuary. So include large body fish, black bream, but also tiny small prey species like smallmouth hardy head. But you also got these interesting uh, diagonal fish which move between marine and fresh water to complete their life cycle. So estuary is an important passage and providing habitat. So Chris Bice will talk more about diagramous fish while I'm focusing on mostly other species. So why flow is important for fish? So they mainly function through three uh, influence. First, that they shape the salinity, uh, maintaining favorable salinity gradient in the Kurong. But then they also uh, support the productivity for estuaries. But as you heard the earlier uh, talks, they're also important in managing the nutrient flux and so maintaining the habitat. But very important is fresh water maintain the connectivity across the system, either between marine and fresh water, even that the fish waste dependent on fresh water flow to, to run and allow fish to migrate. So as you can see, this is the uh, last 30 years of barrage discharge info. So it's showing that, well, compared to pre-regulation model info, there has been 70% of reduction of the flows in the system. And this is causing a massive impact. So its best exam example is during the millennium drought. So the system is really stressed with bugger or any flow throughout the decade. And the Murray mouth have to be dredged to keep the connectivity 
I mean, even now, dredging is still going on. And then also that um, the whole system with um, increased salinity, so South Lagoon is four times hypermarine, which is quite stressful. Even some of the salt tolerant species like smallmouth hardy head, they disappear from the South Lagoon. And also there are loss of rupias, so a lot of ecological issues. So since the flow resumption after 20 Pen and including some natural flow, but also supported by environmental water, we see some improvement in the system. And I'm going to talk about fish uh, communities. So it's great that our research and monitoring a lot of target fish ecology and population dynamics work is from around the mid of the millennium drought and up to recent dates. So this experience extreme variable hydrology that allowed us to learn some drivers and look at what's the low flow drought impact, what is the high flow ecological response. So I'll show you some result, which is great examples. So this complex uh, fish assemblage uh, data, I explained that is um, so each dot is representing the whole fish community. And either that with different colors showing those in different regions. So you've got Murray Estuary and green in the middle is North Lagoon and South Lagoon. So regardless that what flow period, this is 14 years data. So estuary fish, North Lagoon fish assemblage and then South Lagoon. So they, they have spatial difference, although some overlap. But then the circle ones is showing that during the millennium drought, fish assemblage is quite different. So the main thing is that they are driven and by those marine species. So even whitings and Australian salmons and anchovies, they come to the coral. But then in the post flow period, you see an increased diversity in the coral about fish species. So you've got those freshwater fish, uh, yeah, bonny herrings, Australian smelt, but you've got Congolese lamprey, those Dargemas fish increase, but estuarine species like Tama gobies and hardy head, and also that those sandy spread and mulloway, they are marine opportunistic species, they also increase the using of cora. So also changes, you see that during the drought period, there's massive reduction in fish abundance and distribution, which fish more concentrated toward the Murray Estuary and northern part of the North Lagoon. So this best exemplified by our data. So both at say Malaway Fisheries production, you can see that they move toward north and little bubble is showing the catch per unit effort. But the lower part is our research data about the Congoli. So the juvenile Congoli use the system as nursery ground. But this is zero, 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 and they all concentrate toward the northern part during the drought. And then after the resumption of flow, there's increase in the fish abundance distribution throughout the Kurong. And you can see that compared to the earlier graph, the fishery production, they expanded to where the South Lagoon in some high flow years. And then also there are research data showing the expansion of the nursery ground in the coral. So in the South Lagoon, as I mentioned that from no fish during the millennium drought to the hundreds of thousands of smallmouth hardy head. However, the diversity is still low. So the recovery of the South Lagoon is quite important. Now, another way of showing this is, is some data about the fish habitat. So a bit complex. So these little contours is showing that the species salinity tolerance. So you've got Malaway, black bream and flounder as example. So they are high tolerance, lower tolerance, depend on the mortality rate. And the X exit is basically showing that from the Murray mouth all the way, 
to the south, uh, south Lagoon, the end. So spatial difference, and then the y-axis is the month, so temporal change over a year. So four panels is showing before drought, and then you go to the millennium drought, so either the early period or later period. And then the resumption of flow during the high flow years. So essentially that contour is basically showing that this white bit is the suitable habitat. So it's about two thirds of the uh, area suitable for Malawi. And then you saw the contraction during the drought. You've got less favorable habitat because they can't tolerate that high salinity and associated conditions. But then post flow, you again see the expansion of habitat. So that's quite a start response about fish distribution. So also that we did some uh, food web investigations over the last decade and using the data, biological data from different source, look at the drought and flow uh, impact on food web. So conceptually, we, we clearly see that there's an enhance of pelagic food web component post flow. And this support the, the complexity, you increase the complexity of the food web, which is boosting the resilience of the ecosystem. All these are quite critical in either supporting fish or waders or water birds, but importantly is the whole ecosystem health, that you need a functioning and resilient food web. So through the healthy Kurong Healthy Basin Trials Investigations project, we are doing currently doing food web research. Now with a few components. First, you need to understand what's the food source sources for key fish and water birds. So we are trying to fill in knowledge gap about doing more research. But then also a large part of study is investigating about food resource availability. But NOVA bit is we not only look at the abundance and biomass, but also we are looking at the bioenergetic aspects. So you need to know the, the migratory bird, whether they need, whether they have enough energy, how much they need. Is the system supporting enough food resource and energy for them to migrate? But also they're understanding the environmental drivers. So you understand about how to manage the system to improve the condition of food resources. So all these, we are going to bring it together through quantitative food web modeling, enable to basically support the decision making. So this quantitative food model, we will link to say uh, Michelle and Matt's integrated model, but using the fundamental hydrodynamic and biogeochemistry model as the input. So this will interact with a range of models or looks nutrient dynamic model or primary producers through uh, Michelle's uh, plant studies. And then all these are supporting scenario analysis. So you can uh, work on that different management intervention scenarios and to see what is the food web response and ecosystem response. So all these are critical in informing the ecosystem management and to restore a functioning food web. Yeah, last one. So last bit, I must mention something about environmental water and exciting black brain recruitment. So I just want to say that the system is in the recovery, but it's a long journey. So, so this is a typical example about that we work together. Um, so recently that freshwater flow uh, supported by environmental water discharge through the barrage is used to manage to create a salt wedge condition, which is productive habitat, but also with favorable salinity gradient. So like fresh water came out, that's Gul, 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 sorry, that's Gulva, and that's Murray Mouth. 
that's from Pelican Point, so that's a uh, mark point, so very north of the North Lagoon. So you're showing the freshwater releases creating some salt wedge conditions that could promote black bream uh, recruitment. So we got some success in 17, 18, which is great. But the point I want to mention is this adaptive management. Actually, we work together with water managers and barrage operators, but it's greatly supported by uh, fishers and community advisory group and science advisory group. So, so scientists are working with a range of stakeholders to make it work. So that's great. Lastly, quickly recap about the learnings. So fish assemblage is quite dynamic in the Coorong and its key driver is salinity, connectivity and productivity. The freshwater inflow is critical for the overall fish and ecosystem health. And we really need a science to underpin the management. And because it's a dynamic system, and I can't say more that long-term data is critical both for learning and basically informing the management. And we need a collaborative approach and long-term commitment and a concerted effort to improve the health of the Kurong. Thanks very much. And I have a host of people to acknowledge. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> huge, yeah, over yeah, 15 years research. Funding bodies, and I should mention that commercial Fishers are providing sample and data, and agency people, barrage operators, uh, Naranjuri Group support some field work, and a lot of Saudi researchers and also collaborative researchers are helping out. So that's great. And CAP and SEC is playing a critical role for, for the management of this unique ecosystem. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, so now we have Chris Bice, Diadrom, how do I even say it? Diadromos, Diadromos fish. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, so I've been lucky enough to work in this part of the world on, on fishes for about the last 15 years or so, and um, particularly on Diadromos fishes. And today I'm just going to tell you a story, I suppose, on the population trends of these species and also their management over that period. Um, but firstly, I just want to also acknowledge uh, my colleague, Brenton Zampati, who I've conducted most of this work with. So I just want to acknowledge him as a co-author. So firstly, what is a diadromous fish? Well, quite simply, they're, they're those species that require movement between marine and freshwater environments to complete their life cycle. And some of these fish really undertake some of the most impressive migrations in the animal kingdom. And in the Murray-Darling Basin, there are six species of diadromous fish that are, that are actually native to the basin. And four of these have been a focus of our research in the past 15 or so years. Congoli, common galaxius, short-headed lamprey and pouch lamprey. And really the Congoli and the two lamprey species will be a, a focus of my talk today. Now just to explain them a little bit further, um, the Congoli is considered to be what's called a catadromous fish. So it's got a life history which is characterised by adult freshwater residents, um, downstream migration to the marine environment for spawning, and then the juveniles undertake these corresponding upstream migrations into freshwater environments. Now these guys are pretty locally distributed, I suppose, within the basin. Their, their main habitat area is around the lower lakes and Kurong. Um, so they've got these populations and that really operate at a local scale. The two lamprey species, however, are quite different. So they've got the opposite um, form of life history. So these guys actually spend most of their adult life in the ocean. Um, they swim around parasitizing larger fishes, and then they migrate upstream into freshwater environments to spawn. Um, and in the Murray, that can be over quite vast distances. And indeed, there's historical records of these species from as far upstream as Yarrawonga on the upper Murray. Uh, the juveniles then spend quite a bit of time in fresh water before ultimately migrating down to the ocean. So apart from having these really kind of interesting life histories, why do we even care about these things? Well, first of all, the barrages represent the primary barrier to these things moving between these two critical environments. Um, and because of that, all of the species that are native to the basin have un seen declines since uh, regulation of the river. 
Secondly, they're pretty important for food web dynamics as well. Congoli being quite an abundant fish is a really important prey item for a range of large, larger perceivorous fishes and birds. So they're really quite important in, um, in transferring energy between different trophic levels. So just to sort of summarise that initial context, I suppose, because these things have got such migratory life histories, they're really dependent on connectivity between freshwater and marine environments. And therefore their population dynamics are heavily influenced by operation of the barrages. Um, and because of this, they represent just awesome indicators of management actions that really seek to promote connectivity and flow. And because of this reason, they've had specific ecological objectives and targets under the Living Murray program since about 2006 or seven. Um, and additionally, they've got specific objectives in the basin wide watering strategy in the basin plan. So despite the barrages being constructed a long time ago and there being some knowledge about them obstructing movement for a long time, it wasn't really till the early 2000s that really a bit of steam got up behind the idea of mitigating this impact. Uh, when the first fishways were constructed in 2003, and these things are, are simply an, an engineered structure that aims to facilitate the movement of fish past a barrier. Um, and whilst these first three fishways really represented the, the first permanent pathway for fish past the barrages, they also, um, good for us, um, represented a really unique sampling tool for us to monitor migrations of fish past the barrages as well. And these would, would be the precursor to several more fishways, which I'll talk about later. Um, but importantly, to note, these things need water to operate. So another bit of important context with regards to, to our research in the past sort of couple of decades is as you all know, with the advent of the Basin Plan and the Commonwealth Environmental Water Office is that there's been increasingly greater holdings of environmental water. Um, and whilst all this water doesn't get delivered to this particular site, um, in recent years, it's really been quite critical in, um, in supporting discharge from the barrages. Uh, another bit of context, um, I just wanted to talk about the relationship between science and management. Uh, it can be a pretty complex relationship um, but there's a couple of important principles, I think, to talk about. And when we talk about ecological investigations, you can really split them into two types. There's ecological monitoring, which aims to identify patterns in assemblages or in populations. But then there's allied research um, projects, which really seek to um, investigate the process which is underlying the patterns that we're seeing. And really, management needs to use both sets of data to inform its actions, which should then hope to promote sustainable populations in the longer term. And I really think our story on diadromous fishes is a, is a really perfect example of this triangle, if you will, in motion. So we've had a, a long-term monitoring program, which has been the, the backbone of our work, uh, but we've also had several allied research projects and management's been informed by both. And there's been a range of different management actions that have been undertaken in the past 10 or so years. And I'll talk about a few of those. This is basically what our annual monitoring program looks like, which has been going since 2006, largely supported by the Living Murray program. So those first fishways that were constructed, we monitor those fishways annually in spring and summer to look at the abundance of upstream migrating fishes and particularly diadromous fish. Um, we also monitor sites immediately adjacent to the barrages. And in more recent years, we've also monitored during winter specifically to look at the upstream migration of lamprey. As I said, at the same time, we, we've conducted several research projects. So some of these um, have inc included acoustic and pit telemetry projects, looking at the movement of adult Congoli, um, or indeed adult lamprey, both pouched and short-headed in recent years. While we've had other research projects looking at the effectiveness of different fishway designs. So that's basically when these fishways are constructed, are they actually passing the species and size classes that they were designed to pass? Um, and also how their function differs with hydrology. Um, you've probably seen this plot before, I think Chief Feng presented it, but I just want to reiterate, I guess, the hydrology experienced over um, our time down here doing this research. It's been highly variable. Uh, this is discharged cumulatively across the barrages. Notably, we've got the period of the millennium drought from 2007 to 2010 when there was no water discharged. Few floods thrown in there as well, but almost as importantly, I think, is this period from about 2013 through to 2020 when environmental waters really comprised a substantial proportion of flow. So finally, onto a bit of data. Um, this plot represents uh, the mean annual abundance of upstream migrating juvenile Congoli across the barrage network from 2006 through to now. 
And probably the most notable thing um, on this plot is really the period 2006 to 2010 when these fish just crashed and basically they, they almost weren't there at all. So when this was happening, uh, in 2009, we'd actually um, initiated our movement study looking at the, the movement patterns of adult female Congoli in Lake Alexandrina. Um, and much of the year, these, these fish don't do much. They sit around being quite sedentary. But then during winter, these adult females undertake these driven downstream migrations. Um, at this period, though, the barrages were shut. And so basically, they get stuck behind the barrage, aggregate, they get eaten or migrate back upstream to wait for another year. But ultimately, they weren't able to, to reach their marine spawning habitats. And this is likely the process that was behind the decrease in abundance of juveniles migrating upstream in spring and summer. In 2010, however, we continued the project for something different happened. We used the Gilwa navigation lock to facilitate passage of some of these fish downstream and also the drought ultimately broke. So these fish in that year were able to bypass Gilwa barrage, reach marine spawning habitats. And in winter, since then, this has been able to occur on an annual basis. So since the drought and immediately after that season when the barrages were reopened, there was an increase in abundance of these juvenile fish migrating upstream and they just continued increasing in abundance till 2014 when they really peaked. Um, and since this time, abundance has been quite variable, but it's, it's been really quite high. You probably can't see on this plot, but there's a, a red line at the bottom, which is basically our reference value to determine whether um, the objective for this species is being achieved under the Living Murray program, and it's been achieved since 2013. So these fish are really doing quite well. Um, monitoring and research with lamprey has followed a, a pretty similar approach. And uh, this plot here presents the, the raw numbers of, of both pouched and short-headed lamprey sampled at the barrages since 2006. Um, just to bring it up again, these guys have the opposite life history to Congoli. So these guys are migrating upstream into freshwater to spawn. So this is the abundance of adults moving upstream. Um, and short-headed lamprey were, were captured in quite good numbers early on. Then they were absent for around about 10 years and have just recently been starting to pick up in numbers. Pouch lamprey, a similar thing, um, low in abundance, but since about 2015 have really been increasing in numbers quite well. This plot uh, basically is the, the same as the Congoli one to determine whether we've, we're meeting our targets for these particular species as part of the Living Murray program. Um, An achievement of that target is, is met if this dashed line is basically exceeded. For short-headed lamprey, which are the, the darker dot, um, we have never actually reached that target in recent years, but we've, we've got a positive trend, which is, which is fantastic. We're moving in the right direction. But pouch lamprey have met their TLM target several times in recent years. And um, in part, this is likely due to a, a greater frequency of monitoring, which we do in winter. But a really important thing to note is that in each of the years when the target's been met for this species, there's been a considerable whack of water released from the barrages during winter. Now this water is, is critical not only to get the fishways operating, but also to stimulate these fish to actually migrate into the Kurung in the first place. And what's interesting is in most of those years, that water's actually been, it's been environmental water, but it's been multi-site delivery. And that water is, has really originated from releases in the Darling for ecological objectives up there, and it's then been subsequently used down here. Now, these fish don't just stop when they pass the barrages either they actually keep going quite a long way. And this plot here shows basically that a movement plot for an individual um, and the y-axis is kilometres from the river mouth. Now each one of those dots you see is basically a fishway on a main channel weir of the River Murray. And this particular individual was last detected at Lock 10 at Wentworth. Um, and indeed now we've got examples of both this species, pouch lamprey and short-headed lamprey migrating at least as far as Lock 11 at Mildura. So when you think of the contemporary river, it's, it's rather fragmented, but in, in this context, these species are still undertaking these really vast migrations and fish reaching these sort of far distance upstream locations is only possible by passing them at the barrages in the first place. Um, On to another bit of uh, research that, that we've done without presenting a lot of data, but that's the informing fishway design through these fishway assessments and, and seeing how effective they are. So our long-term monitoring program has really helped with this as well. So those initial fishways that were constructed were really, we thought that large fish movement was probably important. So these fishways were really designed for those larger fish. However, our monitoring subsequently showed that really we should be emphasising the passage of small fish and particularly juveniles of catadromous species. So that really changed our, our idea of what, what fishways to, the, to design. And so there was greater emphasis on, on such fishways 
they were constructed, and then it was a real iterative process as more were constructed, we were able to work out how these fishways functioned as well under different conditions, so high flow, low flow, etc. And the last fishways really had an emphasis on making sure they were complementary to others that were already existing. So at the end of the day, we've now got 11 fishways across the whole barrage network. They're really complementary. They pass small fish, they pass large fish under low flow and under high flow. And it's really something to be proud of. It's one of the most probably ambitious fishway programs on a tidal barrier in the world. And collectively, they pass millions of individual fish on an annual basis. Yep, thank you. All right, so that's quite perfect. Just to start wrapping up, um, I think this work's been, been really good at informing on both local and large scale management, um, and particularly environmental water delivery. So through the long-term monitoring program um, and also some of our, our research investigations, we've identified critical periods for migration of these fish, and therefore critical periods for discharge and fishway operation. And really, um, that's from June to January. Operation of the fishways is probably critical year-round, but the, the real key periods are June to January. Um, discharge of water is often, like in addition to the fishways operating, is often really important. Um, and environmental water is critical to this, and particularly multi-site watering, where we can get multiple benefits um, from shared water use. And I've already touched on the example of winter, where we've we've seen benefits from collaborating with the guys in the Goulburn and using that water then down here. But also in spring and summer in the past couple of years, most of the water that's been discharged from the barrages has indeed been environmental water, and often from multi-site watering events that have actually started far upstream as Hume. Um, and these fish are just a, a great um, they're a great indicator of the benefit of this water. Really, the response is directly attributable. If you don't have water, you don't have fishways operating and you don't have fish. And to really, I guess, hammer that point home, here's discharge at the barrages from 2015 through to 2020 and the contribution of environmental water to that overall discharge. And as you can see, there's plenty of periods when environmental water represents 100% of the water flowing out of the, fish, uh, flowing out of the barrages and to operate the fishways, and that means this water is 100% attributable to the positive responses we've seen in some of these fish. Um, there's been a range of changes at a local scale that have happened as well, and a lot of this is really owed to collaboration with the river operators, SA Water. Um, and a lot of these actions have really been to, to maximise passage at that local scale. So things like making sure that we discharge water from gates immediately adjacent to fishways so that fish are attracted towards the fishways rather than to positions on the barrage away from the fishways. Um, and then there's been other things like prioritisation of different barrages for discharge at different times of year to, for, to aim for specific outcomes for different species. Um, and this includes in the advent of, of drought again in the future. So we actually have a, a, dr a draft sort of list of, of shutdown should we enter bad conditions again to ensure that fish passage is provided um, as good as possible for as long as possible in the advent of those crappy conditions. Um, on to my, my final conclusions, and they're actually very similar to Chief Eng's, um, which is always good, but I just really want to stress the importance, I guess, of, of long-term data sets, and particularly in these environments like this, where we have highly variable climate and variable river conditions. Um, can't stress the importance of them more. Um, but just as important is, is these data sets then driving a range of hypotheses that can be the subject of, of allied research projects. And that's really where we can um, find out some information that's really informative to management. And it's good to see that there's a, a range of new projects happening as part of the Healthy Kurong Healthy Basin project. Um, and last but not least, and this is sort of a conclusion, but also a bit of a thank you, but, but all of this work and, and basically management actions are, are simply not possible with, with great collaboration between a, a, a hell of a lot of people really. Um, a range of different managers, water holders, the river operators, um, researchers and engineers. So um, thanks to a lot of people for, for what's happened down here. And I don't think the, the population trends of these species would be like they are without that collaboration. Um, and as it was the very last thing, there's always a range of different things that we can still keep doing. I think we can actually get better at, at um, providing connectivity at the barrages through things like nuanced gate operation. And we still don't know a, a range of things about some of these species. So I'd really hope that these can be targets for research in the future. Thank you very much.